everyone. Welcome to today's virtual conference on the economic outlook for Turkey in 2020. My name is Brooke Snowden, and I am the program manager here at the Bretton Woods Committee. I would like to thank you all for joining us today, especially our esteemed speakers who we'll hear from shortly. This program is part of our quarterly regional spotlight series. Today we'll be examining the strengths and vulnerabilities in the Turkish economy as the country rebounds from currency and debt crisis in 2018, as well as the steps that can be taken to bolster resilience on the road to recovery. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items to help audience members uh, participate in today's event. Uh, you should see the attendee control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You can collapse and expand the control panel by clicking on the orange arrow icon. By default, you have joined using your computer speaker system. If you're having any audio connection issues or would prefer to join uh, over the telephone, just select phone call and the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Participants will have an opportunity to ask questions during the Q&A portion of the discussion. If you have a question, please type it into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time and I will collect these and call on individuals so you may pose your question directly to the speakers over your microphone. You will be prompted when it is your turn to ask a question. Uh, Gary Kleiman will be moderating today's conversation. He is the co-founder and senior partner of Kleiman International Consultants and one of our own Bretton Woods Committee members. He has held positions with international consulting firms in New York and Washington, as well as with the United Nations. He's also served as an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service a financial sector expert for the World Bank and IMF First Initiative, and a columnist for the Financial Times. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And Gary, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speakers and kick off today's discussion. Thank you so much, Brooke. I'm sorry that uh, the original host, Starla, could not be here. Um, she's ill, and we won't make any tasteless references to spreading viruses before we turn to our subject at hand. And I wanted to uh, thank all the Bretton Woods members uh, for coming online. I know there's a lot of interest in this topic from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, before turning it over uh, to our speakers, I'll just uh, make some preliminary remarks and they'll elaborate. Uh, as you know, uh, Turkey in many analysts' observation has been moving in the wrong direction, uh, whether you look at the domestic and ex uh, external economic performance and reform agenda, uh, finance and banking, uh, politics and geopolitics. And certainly a few years ago, um, there was the prospect of a very severe uh, currency and debt crisis, and maybe that cloud still hangs over, uh, and our speakers will address um, those elements in brief uh, opening 10-minute remarks. And then I will uh, moderate a discussion between them for another 20 minutes to a half hour, and then we'll leave the rest to you uh, to ask uh, your questions. Uh, just some general background on our speakers. You have their bio. Uh, they definitely come from uh, the investment universe, and they have a financial market uh, orientation. Uh, Tim has a long, uh, well-known track record uh, as an uh, economist uh, and a research expert at various investment uh, houses. Um, Murat uh, had his own firm um, and is still very active in investing on his own uh, account, focusing on Turkey, the Middle East, global emerging markets more generally, and also is very involved in uh, the leading organization, the American Turkish uh, or leading organization uh, in this country. So he has a, a, a broader interest. And I'm going to ask uh, both our speakers, starting with Murat, you know, to try to cover the waterfront a, a little bit and not get too technical. And then we'll uh, delve a little bit further after they make those 10 minute remarks. So Murat, I'll turn it over to you first. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, and great seeing you after a number of years. <laughs> uh, thank you, Brooke, and all of my friends over at uh, Bretton Woods for inviting me. Very kind of you to do so. Um, I am going to speak briefly more in kind of bullet point form, and I'll do it in three parts. Uh, one, sort of domestic conditions, economy. Uh, I actually was in Istanbul uh, just three weeks ago over the uh, holiday break for about 12 days, so, and I was able to speak to quite a few people there. 
despite the holiday break. Uh, but domestic conditions and two, domestic politics and likely outcomes, things have changed quite a bit in the last six months after a long, long number of years um, in, in, in domestic politics that have stayed the same. And then three, uh, international uh, issues, uh, conflicts, uh, and then likely outcomes from there. Uh, in terms of domestic conditions, um, you know, the, the latest economic indicators are basically anemic at best. The GDP is flat, uh, up uh, almost uh, about a 1% for 2019. Um, unemployment is flat and high for uh, any economy at about 13.5%. Inflation has been declining. Um, latest numbers are about 11.8% year on year. Uh, but uh, there are um, quite, quite a number of issues with uh, food price uh, inflation, uh, which, is, which is being felt by the greater population, which is something that I noticed while I was in Istanbul. It was a, it was a topic of discussion that was almost everywhere. Uh, some baskets, uh, food price baskets, uh, are up 42% year on year, which is kind of stunning. I can't understand how that's possible, but apparently it is. Um, interest rates by the central bank have been declining very aggressively since actually mid-2019, from around 24%, uh, which was sort of the, at, at the height of sort of the currency troubles uh, that started in mid-2018. Actually, uh, I remember that period as well, the summer of 2018, when the Turkish lira kind of spiraled from 3.5 to the dollar to around 6 to the dollar within a couple of months. Um, but since then, uh, since th that spike in interest rates, the central bank has been aggressively trying to build uh, expectations down in interest rates and, and inflation expectations. Uh, balance of trade is uh, has been as high as negative uh, 3.2 billion on a, a monthly basis, but now at around 2.2 billion. But the trade gap has narrowed considerably because of the anemic economy, which is you know uh, a good thing. Business confidence uh, has been edging up since uh, around uh, mid 2019 for the past five months, albeit from pessimistic levels. Manufacturing is still in slight contraction with the PMI, manufacturing PMI at 49.5. Retail sales, again, were negative for quite some time, actually, during the sort of autumn period 2019, but they're now starting to edge up. Um, so there is a nascent kind of recovery. Um, the uh, economy minister is actually in Davos today as we speak talking about a V-shaped recovery. I wouldn't call it a V-shaped recovery, but there is some sort of kind of resumption of some balance of stability. Uh, IMF projections for 2020 are uh, from here, perhaps 3% GDP growth. Of course, for Turkey, this is kind of on the low end. Turkey is used to five, six, 7% growth rates in the past. So that's actually, uh, uh, you know, IMF kind of saying it's going to be a tough year. Um, inflation, again, they seem to think is going to stay um, in these 12, 13 percent levels. And unemployment is going to uh, stay uncomfortably high at the 13, 14 percent levels. Uh, the TLUS dollar rate has been managed since the sort of difficult period that started in mid-2018. Uh, continued into 2019. The central bank has been using some blunt monetary policy instruments to do so, one of them being uh, required reserves held uh, for foreign deposit, foreign exchange deposits from the banking system, raising required deposit rates aggressively uh, and, and, and in short order from 12.5% up to 19% at a time thereby um, accumulating dollars onto the central bank balance sheet very rapidly when they need to do so. So there are all sorts of mechanisms that the bureaucrats at the central bank have become very adept at, at uh, managing um, currency balances. 
at the central bank. Um, meanwhile, the Turkish policy is not terribly impressed by all of that because currency checking deposits, uh, foreign exchange deposits at uh, the banking system have grown from 2019 start of $193 billion to $224 billion currently. And also, um, the, uh, the uh, confidence of foreign investors, foreign direct investment in particular, is uh, at a low ebb. Um, in 2019, the numbers fell to some very low level uh, in, in the order of about $2.5 billion. So there, there, there's certainly um, there's certainly scope for uh, upward movement, if you will, uh, from here on out, as long as there aren't any shocks to the system. And that brings me to kind of the second and third piece, which is the second piece being domestic politics have changed quite dramatically with the municipal elections of uh, mid 2019, uh, particularly the redone. Istanbul elections, which um, at, the, at the outset, they were challenged by the AKP governing uh, coalition um, and re, uh, uh, redone in uh, three, two months later with even a larger majority uh, voting for the opposition candidate, the CHP candidate who has now been installed. But beyond that, um, six of the other largest uh, cities in, in, in Turkey have also gone to the opposition candidate uh, that have been lost by the AKP. When you look at this in a sort of aggregate form in a, in a national, you know, 30,000 foot level, it's important to note that all of these um, uh, municipalities represent about 53% of Turkish GDP. And in fact, if you include all the CHP municipalities that were won during the municipal elections, that's 62% of Turkish GDP. That, that's a lot of potential economic power in the hands of grassroots leaders of the opposition parties for the first time since 2001. That's a major, major difference that is occurring right now in Turkey. And the result has been there's been mutiny on the bounty, which is to say that um, for the first time, AKP has had a mutiny of, of, of the senior ranks where the former Prime Minister Davutoglu and the Deputy PM and uh, much respected uh, internationally uh, former economy and Deputy Prime Minister Ali Babajan have uh, resigned from AKP and set up their own parties. You know, this is akin to, for example, um, uh, Mr. McConnell and Mr. Graham resigning from the GOP and forming their own parties inside the Senate. I mean, it's a real kind of earth-shaking thing that most people don't quite realize outside of Turkey. Anyway, this is only, you know, it, it's only a beginning, but it could lead, I mean, my estimation it could lead to early elections for the parliament, which is, of course, something that um, would change the dynamic of uh, of, of not only Turkey politically, but also uh, could change the dynamic uh, economically. Um, the other obvious per, uh, issue is that a number of international issues have been rising in the ranks uh, over the last uh, six months. And these are the US-Turkey relationship, which is in a constant state of flux, sometimes very fine, sometimes very bad. And it has a lot to do with the uh, two presidents kind of um, managing to see eye to eye or not. So that's a kind of a, a tough thing to plan around, let's put it this way. That also leads to a conflict with NATO because there are certain issues having to do with Russian missile systems that are being uh, purchased by Turkey, which are incompatible with NATO systems. And thus NATO is very upset about this. There's, of course, the northern Syria uh, incursion uh, where a conflict uh, with the Kurds has taken a new dimension, but that has also pitted Turkey against uh, Assad and Russia, his, uh, his protector. Then the killing, killing of the Iran general all of a sudden brings Iran into the picture in ways that makes Turkey uncomfortable. 
because it's caught in the middle between US and Iran, Iran being a major uh, uh, trading partner. There's Eastern Mediterranean exploration for oil and gas, which is a whole new thing that pits Turkey against Cyprus, Greece, Israel, potentially Russia. And then there's now new Libya, troops sent to Libya. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a number of things that are out there that weren't in the picture to such a great extent literally six months ago. So things are obviously in flux. I'll leave it there for <laughs> with, with no answers, but a lot of questions. <laughs> Thank you, Murat. That, that was a really sweeping presentation, and it certainly underscores when you look at Turkey, you have to factor in all these cross currents. Um, and I'll turn it over to Tim. I mean, he can cover a lot of the same territory, or feel free to, to challenge um, Murat early on on some of these points. And um, just to let you know that uh, Murata is based in New York and Tim is in London. I think, Tim, uh, you're you're coming in uh, just on the audio, right? So we'll we'll let you for uh, 10 minutes or so, and then I'll moderate a subsequent discussion. Yeah, sure. Apologies. Uh, technological problem from my side, so uh, you don't get to see my, uh, my ugly mug. Uh, that's probably a ben benefit to everyone on the line. Um, <clears throat> um, I thought the way I'd kind of look at it is, uh, you know, to look forward, you've kind of got to look back a little bit. And and my question, the three questions I'll kind of ask are, you know, what went wrong in 2017, 2018? Um, how they got through that period? Uh, and finally, did they learn? And what does that tell us about the story going forward? Now, you know, if you go back to the 2018 crisis, I mean, essentially, this was a classic balance of payments, overheating kind of story uh, driven by the political cycle. So, you know, essentially the economy was being run uh, on red hot because Erdogan, uh, you know, likes elections. We'd had a constitutional reform referendum. Uh, we then were heading into presidential parliamentary elections. Uh, the secret of Erdogan's success over the last um, almost 20 years now it's been about it's been about the economy. It's about been creating jobs. Uh, Turkey uh, has a dearth in domestic savings. It has to fund itself externally, uh, and they were they they were running the economy on a very high growth rate. But uh, growth, you know, was funded by well, I mean, a, a high growth meant a high import demand, which meant a very large current account deficit. Uh, historically, a lot of growth had been funded by foreign borrowing, so Turkey. Uh, had a weight of uh, uh, foreign debt. So, you know, in 2018, essentially, Turkey had a, a very big external financing requirement. Basically, over 50 billion current account deficit, about 180 billion short term debt. So, a 230 billion uh, external financing requirement reserves were only around 100 billion. Uh, and added into that were major concerns about Turkey's geopolitical orientation. I think it's already been mentioned, but there were lots of stress points in terms of the relationship with Turkey in the West. I think, you know, part of that, a, a, a result of strains around the failed coup in 2016, but just going through the list, obviously there was the Brunson issue, migrants, Syria, S-400, the Golan issue, and Halk Bank. So the market was increasingly concerned about its relationship with the West, prospects for sanctions. We had the Brunson, uh, very moderate sanctions kind of imposed. And there's a big question about how Turkey was going to close that external financing gap. Now, normally, in a situation of overheating, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, policymakers either slow the economy by tightening fiscal or monetary policy, uh, or they let the currency adjust, or they use reserves to fill the, the external financing gap. They didn't really have enough reserves to defend the currency in a meaningful way. Uh, they, the other big concern, I guess, was around, around monetary policy and centralization of, of uh, policy formulation around the presidency and Erdogan's strange views on interest rates. Obviously, we all know about that now, but this idea that, uh, you know, in, it, high interest rates cause inflation. So he took one of the major tools away from policymakers in the face of an overheating economy, uh, a, a need to slow the economy, 
and the message from the presidency is, well, you can, don't don't raise rates, but we expect you to keep the currency more or less stable as well, and you don't have enough reserves. So, in the end, it cracked, and in the end, they they were a bit massively behind the curve when everyone in the market in late 2017 and early 2018 was telling them to put on the brakes. They waited too long, and the result of that was that the currency devalued massively. I mean, we went from you know, a three handle to 7.2 at the low point in 2018. In August uh, 2018, it, it, it wasn't clear as though they were going to do the right thing. And actually, in the end, high rates to hold the currency in, in some way. Uh, and there was that, you know, very strained few days when the currency could have gone even further. And um, at that point in time, people were really concerned about the stability of the, the banking sector. Remember, there was talk about sovereign default at that point in time, although I think that was a bit of an extreme assumption. But, but it, you know, they were on the edge because of policy failures, no doubt about it, uh, and policy failures because of over-concentration of power in the new presidential system around President Erdogan, who had this thing about interest rates um, and didn't believe in normal macro you know, macro orthodoxy. There's no other way way to say it. In the end, for whatever reason, uh, possibly the riot act was read to President Erdogan. He realised people got through to him that if he didn't allow the central bank to raise rates, the currency would totally melt and the banking sector would probably collapse. So, if you remember, you know, August, September, finally. The central bank massively high rates, you know, well over a thousand basis points, 1600 basis points from low to high. They slammed on the brakes and they carried out a very orthodox kind of adjustment. Uh, and the currency adjusted, rates went higher, the economy was pushed into recession. That uh, slashed the external financing gap. The current account deficit went from, you know, 50 odd billion to a surplus. On, the, on a 12-month moving average basis as we are now, a, a remarkable adjustment in terms of the external accounts. Um, and, and that stabilized kind of the ship. And uh, since then, we've seen uh, micromanagement of markets. Uh, we saw the, the, uh, the restriction of the offshore swap market, which basically meant that, that foreigners couldn't short the currency. One of the downsides of that is it's hard to hedge your local government debt exposure, which has meant that foreigners have really stayed out of the local debt market. Arguably, that's made a borrowing costs more more uh, higher. But essentially, they did what they had to do. They they took a, a political hit in terms of lower growth, higher unemployment, a much weaker currency. Uh, but they did it far later than what they could have done, and and the the adjustment would have been much more moderate if they'd adjusted more but sooner. So they, they, they took a policy adjustment. I would also say that, um, you know, why there wasn't a total collapse in 2018. And I, I'd explain it in, in terms of <clears throat> it wasn't just about policy adjustments. It was about there is, there is an underlying durability in the Turkey story. And I'd explain that in, you know, Erdogan may have an aversion to interest rates. And I think it's about usury, an aversion to usury. Uh, but AKP and, and, uh, and the party and Turkish, Turkish society in general is, is entrepreneurial, pro-business, pretty dynamic. Uh, it has these underlying strengths like very favorable demographics, uh, a history of sound public finances. As I mentioned, Erdogan may not like interest rates, but AKP supporters don't like paying taxes. You know, this is, a, this is very much a Thatcherite party in many respects. And so they understand sound public finances. And they went into the crisis in 2018 with a public sector debt ratio of 28%. Uh, so there was a, the talk about the sovereign debt crisis was very premature. They had lots of space. And actually, subsequently, in, in response to recession, they've been able to loosen the fiscal. That's has certainly underpinned growth and moderated the extent of the recession subsequently. The other factor, I think, in the banking sector, you know, uh, certainly the private sector banks, were well aware of the overheating risks in 2017 and 2018, and they were already uh, preparing for uh, a crisis, and they were pretty risk averse in terms of some of their lending activities. So they were they they'd had capital buffers, <coughs> they'd been pretty cautious in terms of lending practices, and they they were they were clearly uh, all of the banking sector was aggressively hit by a combination of higher rates, weaker currency, 
and the movement into recession, NPLs have risen, but from a low level and with relatively strong capital buffers. Um, so what was interesting, despite the, you know, the extremity of the move on the exchange rate, there wasn't uh, a real, there, there wasn't any real sign of a run on banks, which many people would say would be quite remarkable. But I think it reflects the underlying strength of the banking sector and the reforms that were instigated uh, in response to the 2000-2001 crisis and the IMF program that was rolled out in that period. So, so that gave these guys uh, uh, a lifeline, or it helped in terms of the adjustment. And subsequently, in the recovery uh, that Murat has already spoken about, uh, you know, it, it's helped provide something of a floor and something of a base. So, so just just to summarise. Um, uh, the 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 uh, the crisis in 2018 was because of policy error. It was about domestic politics. It was about going for growth, uh, running the economy too hot. Uh, eventually, they understood the severity of the threat facing the economy. They they put on the brakes, uh, and there was some underlying durability that enabled them to get through it. A third question: You know, did they learn, and what does that tell us about you know going forward? Um, you know what we've seen. What we see, we, we saw initially, perhaps for the first three to four months after August, September uh, 2018, was a you know pretty you know they tightened monetary, they tightened fiscal initially anyway. Uh, what we've seen subsequently uh, is a is a loosening and and a going for growth again. So a lot of pressure on state-owned banks to pump credit uh, back into the system. That pressure is now on private banks. Uh, central bankers aggressively cut, uh, cut uh, policy rates, perhaps far more rapidly than, than is prudent. Uh, but essentially, the model of development is, is very similar. This is about a focus on domestic politics. Murat mentioned the difficulties AKP has at the moment with the domestic challenges uh, to the party from Babajan and Davatoglu, and also the loss in Istanbul uh, to Imoglu. And, uh, you know, opinion poll, polls for AKP are you know, not where I think the president would have them to be. So the message to policymakers, again, is get growth back up to 5%, create jobs, and AK support will go back up. And, um, you know, we're seeing a reflation of the economy again. Um, and, you know, my, we are, we'll see the current, same old problems will reemerge, in my view. The current account is, is back in deficit again. Probably this year, the deficit's going to be about $20 billion, $15, $20 billion. Um, the question mark is, you know, I have actually have short, medium, and long-term views for Turkey. Uh, long-term view is positive uh, because after the Istanbul elections, I think you can think of life after Erdogan. You know, Turkey is a democracy. It's a healthy, functioning democracy. What we're seeing within AKP with Babajan and Davatoglu is, is very healthy. Um, and I think in the end, Turkey... You know, as I mentioned, strong demographics, pro-business, entrepreneurial culture, good public finances, strong banks, uh, and, and, and on a longer-term view, I think Turkey is a good place to, biz to do business and will do well. The question mark for me is, it, it, sorry, in the medium term, because of the policy mistakes we're seeing again with monetary policy being too loose, we will see... Uh, the current account deficit widen again, we will see an external financing gap, we will see the economy run too hot, and the central bank will make the same mistakes it did in 2017-2018. It will not be able to tighten policy to slow that overheating economy again. So we will see a, another, uh, another 28 style uh, balance of payments crisis. Uh, the, the question is the timing of that, and then I get into the short term view. And the short term view is this micromanagement of the economy by basically uh, freezing out foreign investors to make sure they can't short the currency. Uh, this re what also we're seeing is the recycling of, of FX, FX deposits to support the currency and, and underpin credit markets to, to, re, to give the perception that credit risk is falling. Um, you know, the, uh, they, they can survive for a period. Uh, the question is when the short gets to the medium and when the, the rope runs out. Probably the global environment we're in at the moment, you know, lengthens the, the length of the rope. Uh, you know, there's a lot of liquidity being pumped around. Uh, that, should, 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 that will certainly help Turkey in terms of running this, 
continuing to run this unorthodox policy with overly loose monetary policy. Um, and the other factor that I think is quite interesting that I haven't mentioned at the moment is the Trump Erdogan relationship. Um, you know, and one of the reasons they've been able to survive in the last year has been this this remarkable relationship between Trump and Erdogan. And, you know, if you'd have met any U.S. government official and any U.S. politician or policymaker six months ago, they would have said with a very high probability that if Turkey gets S-400, it will be sanctioned. Uh, and there was also the issue about the Halk Bank sanctions. And again, every every official you might meet six months ago would have said inevitably Turkey is going to be sanctioned and that's going to have a crippling blow on the Turkish economy. Remarkably... Uh, President Trump has acted as Erdogan's point man, and he's stalled any effort by uh, the U.S. establishment to levy uh, any form of sanction on Turkey uh, for uh, its uh, well, its dalliance with Russia around S-400s, uh, but also if things like the Halk Bank issue. And, and, and it's very hard to explain the relationship between Erdogan and, and Turkey because. Um, I guess I've asked this question to, to U.S. policymakers, and it's the last thing I, I'll say before I conclude. You know, from you know, what is what is the U.S. getting from the Turkish relationship? Because across the board, I see Turkey and the U.S. at loggerheads, whether it's uh, around the Russia relationship, around Syria, um, even in Libya, uh, in terms of what's happening in the Eastern Med. Um, but across the board. Uh, you know, Turkey is not giving the U.S. very much of what it wants. So why is why is Trump so generous to, to President Erdogan? And, and probably that's beyond my ability to explain. Uh, but anyway, so I think I'll probably end there and I'll, I'll put it out to questions anyway. <coughs> Thank you, Tim. I, we certainly wouldn't want to draw out that relationship into a medium and long term scenario necessarily either. But I, I want to return uh, to the economy, and let's dig a little deeper in terms of you know the domestic and and external uh, outlook. And I think um, the implication of both your presentations are, is that um, we are in danger of sort of coming full circle. Um, a lot of the underlying stresses have not been addressed. Uh, GDP growth um, obviously was meager uh, last year, but again, the target is to restore five percent growth, whether that can happen or not, remains to be seen because we're looking to banks, obviously, to pump credit uh, at the same time. You're right. You mentioned this sort of GDP inflation, obviously, trade-off. Yet We have food price inflation coming from other sources, um, even with the currency stable. So I want to draw you out a little bit on you know, what you see um, over the next year. I mean, is this 5% target, I mean, mostly political? Um, or is the expectation have to be scaled back given the underlying fundamentals? What do you see, you know, for inflation? They talked about finally tackling double-digit inflation. And now we know, you know, traditionally, as Tim mentioned, fiscal policy has been, you know, traditionally very well run and tight. Um, but that doesn't account for a lot of contingent liabilities that might occur in trying to rescue the banking system. There's talk about, um, you know, all sorts of centralized management units that might be performed to rescue uh, some of the bad assets on bank balance sheets. And monetary policy, you know, we've gone all the way up to 25%. Now we're coming back almost, you know, to single digits. But one of the drivers of the Turkish story, at least for foreign investors who could remain obviously engaged, is that you had positive interest rates. Now you're at the level, you know, where interest rates are turning you know, uh, negative in real terms. That is, you know, the in inflation rate is above, you know, the benchmark rate. So I wanted to sort of draw you out in terms of the performance, in terms of, you know, GDP growth, inflation, the fiscal monetary policy banking system connection. And what about structural reform? Because we've heard for years, um, you know, Turkey talking about all sorts of changes, you know, whether it's in the, the pension system or even though um, they've traditionally been unable uh, you know, to attract the level of foreign direct investment, business climate changes and the like, um, if you can also sort of address, you know, sort of the reform uh, trajectory as they're trying to deal, you know, with this ongoing crisis. So, Murat, I'll leave it to you, you know, to address whatever you like in that uh, menu. Um, well, I, 
I think, you know, Tim uh, put his finger on something that, you know, not only helps Turkey, but er er every other country on the planet, which is there's this extraordinary amount of liquidity that is now being pumped into the system that wasn't in existence six months ago. And in particular, uh, all you have to do is just go to federalreserve.gov uh, website and look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve System. And since September, when we started having this remarkably complex problem inside the New York Fed of overnight rates going kind of berserk, we've had almost $400 uh, billion of inflation in less than four months, which is extraordinary. It's, a, it, it, it's almost unprecedented. It, it was, I think it was unprecedented even in 2008. So, uh, and, and, and the proof of the pudding is the Turkish stock market is at an all-time high. And, uh, you know, there are plenty of folks besides me who think that's way overvalued based on earnings uh, in, in, in an anemic economy for uh, corporates on, listed on the stock exchange. So, that's the one thing that kind of is holding a lot of things um, uh, are, 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 are up at the moment. Uh, the second thing I would say is that um, the the what Tim did mention is that it, again what is uh, Ankara trying to do? It's trying to jumpstart the economy in ways that are kind of well known inside Turkey. One of them is, for example, the construction sector is has been very weak and. Uh, they have managed to reduce mortgage rates, uh, you know, and basically, you know, price manipulation, reducing interest rates for mortgages so that, uh, you know, a lot of inventory gets sold. So economic activity is generated inside the construction sector. They're trying to come up with uh, new uh, infrastructure projects, the biggest one being this famous uh, Canal Istanbul, which is a 20 billion plus project. I mean, that's a serious size project in any economy. And in Turkey, that would be a major um, economic activity booster, if you will. So th the president is very aggressively pursuing that. But, you know, again, there's a lot of, when I was in Istanbul, there was just constant uh, discussion uh, and, and, and um, uh, pushback. Uh, from environmentalists, from folks that are worried about Istanbul kind of losing its character, losing its it, it, its ability to uh, you know use the Bosphorus efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. There's just huge numbers of issues there. But the bottom line is, it is the right policy from a fiscal policy perspective. If you want to jumpstart any, I mean, in fact, you should do it inside the United States, right? How many times have we talked about infrastructure spending in the USA, which has not happened for three years now? But that's the kind of thing they're trying to, you know, push through in order to jumpstart the economy. But it does need funding. It does need, you know, external finance. And as long as liquidity exists externally, it will be there. But you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I look at it from my global view and I, I this cannot continue that fed balance sheet is just absurd absurd uh, and everybody in one wall street knows this but nobody will say it openly uh, and when that music stops it's not going to be pretty anywhere least of all in countries that need external financing thanks murat and tim you can pick up on you know mostly the the domestic side in terms of performance and uh, fiscal monetary policy and reform as well. But since Murat sort of segued into the external financing and we're running short of time, um, he mentioned, you know, the global liquidity environment. But, you know, Turkey, as you alluded to, has always been able to roll over, um, you know, its private sector debt fairly easily. I mean, this is a private sector overwhelmingly uh, debt burden. It's about $100 billion coming due right over the next year, owned by both uh, banks and companies, and certainly the external liquidity environment helps. But what about you know the underlying views of the the counterparties? Um, are they skeptical um, that they can move beyond sort of this improvisation? And then are we sort of setting ourselves up or delaying an a, an inevitable sort of corporate debt crunch that obviously could become you know uh, a sovereign uh, 
uh, concerns sooner rather than later. So, you know, feel free to address any one of those areas and, and maybe the, the five minutes before we try to do a political, geopolitical, and then open it to questions. Yeah, sure. Look, um, I mean, in terms of the macro story for this year, I mean, you know, the consensus forecasts are growth is going to be around 2.5%, 3%. Uh, current account widening a bit, inflation is pretty sticky. Uh, the government obviously wants growth above 2.5% towards 5%. The question is, in, in my mind, and, and link it into the question, how that's financed, right? I mentioned that likely the current account will go into deficit. There is still $180 billion of short-term debt they need to finance. So there's probably going to be an external financing requirement of about $200 billion. Now, two things I think were quite, have been quite interesting over the past year. One of them is domestic dollarization. So in many respects, the lira looks cheap. Uh, and yet, it's been a one-way train in terms of dollarization. I mean, now FX deposits around $200 billion. And it's a constant, there's a constant demand from locals for, for dollars. Now, historically, uh, in previous periods when you've had these, these uh, policy sell-offs, tightening, et cetera, uh, Turks have been pretty quick to buy lira. Uh, what's amazing and, and very different for me is in the period since you know, the crisis in 2018, we haven't seen that reversal in terms of locals' demand for dollars. And that's worrying. I mean, that needs to change. And it's, it's, it, it's not changing because I think you know, that domestic policy rates are too low on Lira, uh, there's a lack of underlying confidence in the policy settings, there's perhaps underlying lack of confidence in the political settings of the country that means that uh, locals prefer dollars over Lira. And the second thing that's quite interesting is that, um, again, if you go back to those periods of uh, market dislocation in Turkey where you've had uh, uh, policy rates been forced higher and then lower, so 2006, 2011, 12, uh, 15, 16, uh, in all those previous periods, uh, you know, once policy rates were set at a very high level, and then as policy rates came lower, foreign portfolio investors poured into the story, obviously driven by prospects of rate cuts, bond, bond price appreciation. What's really noticeable is last year, despite a thousand basis points of rate cuts, which should have been a feeding frenzy for foreign portfolio investors, uh, there was a net outflow from portfolio investors, I think about a couple of billion dollars. <clears throat> now, historically, you should have seen an inflow of 20 billion. So why is that? What is the common thing between the domestic locals and the foreign portfolio investors? And really, it's, a, it's an underlying lack of confidence in, in monetary policy, right? And, you know, from a foreign portfolio perspective, you know, 10% nominal, 10, 11% nominal yields you know, might look attractive in a in a Fed a loose Fed environment, right? But the question I think foreign portfolio investors are asking in a scenario where, as has been mentioned, Fed has to tighten, or you see a geopolitical hit and you see pressure on the lira, <coughs> will the central bank of Turkey do the right thing? Will they hike rates? And the answer is we don't know. Well, we don't think they will. So there's this underlying lack of confidence in the monetary policy settings means that. Foreigners don't really want to fund Turkey, and that's a that's a challenge going forward, right? It's how are they going to roll 180 billion of short-term debt and 20 billion and increasing current account deficit in an environment where foreign investors really don't trust the policymakers to do the right thing when they need to do it, and a, a, an aggressive agenda from the presidential palace to cut rates. <coughs> And I think that, that makes Turkey pretty vulnerable, right? I mean, if we see a turn in the Fed, if we see geopolitics, if we, you know, there's, there's talk about Southern District of New York finding Halt Bank on a daily basis going from a, mil a million and increasing and doubling every day. I mean, I mean, if we see something like that, if, if Trump, the, 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 you know, I'm going to call Trump somewhat unpredictable. I hope I'm not going to offend American listeners by saying that, but if Trump gets out of bed tomorrow morning and something that Erdogan said to him d displeased him and he decides to do something on Turkey, um, Turkish markets react. Do we think the Central Bank of Turkey will do the orthodox thing to, do, to hold the currency and reduce their financing requirement? I just don't think we will, right? And, and, and uh, so I have big questions about how Turkey is going to finance itself going forward with this monetary this unorthodox monetary stance and with difficult relations with the West. 
Murad, did you want to chime in on that at all in terms of the near-term crunch possibility before we turn to uh, political questions? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement uh, from uh, downtown New York. That's how we <laughs> see it also. Okay. It could happen tomorrow morning. Last, last night, there were only 142 tweets. And, and certainly the politics, you know, weighs on the economic policy choice, you know, more heavily perhaps than ever. Both of you pointed out um, what I think that you would see it as and you can reinforce it, whether it's a positive development at all, um, you know, that you have the opposition not only winning Istanbul, but in control of other cities, that it's a considerable chunk of GDP, as you pointed out. And you have sort of the internal challenge from former uh, respected uh, diplomats and technocrats, the deputy prime, uh, prime minister. But in the meantime, it can re reinforce some of the bad tendencies, let's say, of the incumbent um, in terms of economic policy to preserve uh, the, their position. So I wonder how you see this sort of playing out. Um, is it sort of a, a medium, longer term positive story that, you know, there is this more political space and maybe that will lead to more economic policy experimentation. But in the meantime, you know, it could uh, reinforce some of the worst tendencies we've seen to date. Or you see that, you know, as a positive, um, even in the next, uh, you know, let's say six months um, in terms of how it affects um, the call for potential elections, as well as, you know, the proper economic policy choices. You're right. You can go first. Well, I mean, from 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 what I've described about you know the, the the sort of sea change in domestic politics, and from what I know about the president, who I've known for several decades. By the way, I've known both presidents for several decades, which is kind of weird, but there you have it. Um, but um, you know, he's 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 just he's going to take a stance that's going to be. I'm digging in even harder now. I've got to fight harder now. And it's going to be unpleasant. It's not going to be, you know, clean. There's going to be fighting. There's going to be stuff going on that we haven't seen before. Uh, I mean, how would you like it if your brother-in-law and your cousin, uh, you know, decided to, uh, you know, create a new company to destroy your company? How would you feel in that instance? Not a not a good place to be, you know. And they're even closer than that. Those 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 people. They created AKP in 2001. They sat in a room and they created it. And then there's of course the um, the unknown entity, the former president Abdullah Gül, and how he would play out here. And there are all sorts of stories about how he will, you know, go with the mutineers. So, I mean, this stuff is not going to be a, an easy slog. And when it comes down to making a decision, well, you know, do I pump up the economy to do what I've done for the last 20 years to get the votes I need? Yes, it's going to pump up the economy. No question about it. None. Tim, do you agree? Do you sort, sort of see this political fluidity as maybe, you know, stiffening the the pessimistic case, at least in the near term as well? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, I think in that period around the rerun of Istanbul elections, right, I think we were all worried about, you know, a Ruby, Rubicon being crossed and there were lots of talk about uh, AKP doing whatever it took to win the rerun election, right, whether it's vote rigging or well, whatever you want to say. I mean, for me, that was a turning point, but actually a positive one in terms of, again, it, it, you know, it proved that Turkey is, is a functioning democracy. Turks made a clear decision, you know, what they wanted. They, they, they decided they don't want Turkey to be an autocratic style place. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think it gave real hope uh, for the future. And I think what we're seeing within AKP is positive. You know, people like Davatoglu and Babajan standing up. Um, I'm hearing, you know, lots of internal critique within AKP, not just people like Babajan and, Dav uh, and Davatoglu have left, but within the party, um, more people are willing to speak out. And, that, and that's, that's pretty healthy. And, and as I said, you know, long term, you know, uh, it, it's, it's possible to think of life after, after Erdogan. And I think, you know, Turkey will return 
uh, return to a more liberal vent. Uh, and, and I think a more West, you know, I, Turkey's, I mean, there's a lot of talk about Turkey's geopolitical orientation and, you know, um, post the coup, a movement towards Russia and, and the East. I, you know, I think in the end, Turks look West. You know, I mean, you could go back to after Turks period, but, you know, Turks, um, they educate their kids in, you know, in Europe or, or uh, the U.S., you know, they, they, they don't educate them in Moscow or Beijing. They don't go shopping in, in Beijing or Moscow. I mean, they, they look west, right? And, and I think, you know, uh, you know, Turkey will reset back towards a Western orientation, in, in my mind. Um, and in the short term, yeah, sure. I mean, there's a big battle with it. You know, there's a big battle for domestic, you know, uh, popularity, you know, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and there is a risk of early elections, not just from stresses within AKP, but obviously Bacelli, the MHP, he's obviously been in pretty ill health. What happens to MHP and the co coalition with AKP if, if uh, uh, Bacelli is no longer able to run the party? Um, but, but uh, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, I mean, I think, you know, with AKP counting every vote and very c concerned about the risk of early elections, the natural the natural impetus or the natural direction for Erdogan and Al Barak, et cetera, is to go for growth, go for growth, go for jobs, go for, try and do all these projects because that's what they understand. I mean, um, Erdogan, for whatever his faults and you know, particularly interest rates, I would have big problems with him. Erdogan understands business. Erdogan in, understands investments, trade. That's what he he likes. That stuff. He likes opening canals and the shopping malls and and roads and stuff like that so there will be a, there is a return to that and and um the problem is in my mind though the question is how he's going to fund it and and when does the music stop again and 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 you know it's it's they can they can muddle through in the short term for a period but event, eventually you know uh, the, the 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 funds are going to run out the music will stop and we'll see a repeat of what we saw in 2018 the question is timing that. Very difficult to time it. Thank you. Uh, this, um, since you raised it, we have one question coming in, but I'm just going to piggyback on what you mentioned in terms of geopolitics and the orientation and the, re the revival of the Western orientation. We talk about the U.S. relationship, obviously, because we have a vested interest. But, uh, Tim, you mentioned, um, you know, the EU, uh, China, Russia. And I wonder whether you're right, whether you share um, – you know, Tim's view that, you know, we will see this reorientation. We know that, you know, tensions are very high with the EU over, you know, refugees and Cyprus and other issues. Uh, China has obviously increased its footprint and cooperation, um, you know, very recently. And, you know, the Russia-Iran uh, connection has sort of been ongoing in terms of, you know, confrontation when we have a, a falling out with President Trump or the U.S. So I wonder whether you see it uh, you know, that way evolving too, or, you know, we could see, uh, you know, a, a much different uh, geopolitical orientation, at least in the, the next year or two. Well, again, uh, I mean, Tim kind of touched on, you know, the, the, the president is kind of like the CEO of the corporation. He's looking where the business lines are working, where the business lines aren't working, right? I mean, that's how he looks at it. In fact, both presidents look at it this way. <laughs> That's why they really like each other, right? And so what do you see? Just look at export performance over the last 12 months, right? Exports are up 52% to the UAE, 22% to Iran, 12.5% to Iraq. They're down 18% to the USA. What does that tell you? I mean, so that that's kind of what you're forced to think about as the CEO of the corporation. What business lines are actually working? And where do I concentrate to get the maximum impact? I mean, it's not rocket science, actually. Um, but, you know, that in, in China, the same thing. You know, exports to China are up, exports to USA are down. That's all you need to look at as the CEO looking at which business lines are working. So, yes, it, it, they look west to go shopping, but they look east to put money in their pockets. Why is Qatar the number one name that has come up as an investor in Canal Istanbul? I mean, it was, it was the talk of every night's uh, talk show in Istanbul while I was watching TV. 
Qatar, 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 Qatar. You know, it's not USA, it's not France, it's not Britain, it's not Germany, it's Qatar, right? And right behind Qatar is probably China. That's really what's happening there. And it is what it is. I mean, is that any different than Singapore? I don't think so. You know what I mean? I mean, at the end of the day, how different is this from Singapore or Malaysia or, um, you know, other centers of economic activity that are non-West, right? I mean, is it really that different? The answer is no. So we have to look at this in practical commercial as well as strategic terms. And I think we have one question. Um, do, uh, Brooke, do you read the question or? Do we know what the question is? I see my microphone is unmuted. Can you hear me? Go yes. ahead. Uh, please identify yourself too, if you if you don't mind. Sure, Frank Linden, World Bank in Washington D.C. Um, so my question was, and I think Tim already answered it, but I want to go a little bit further. Is how would an end to the Erdogan time period in Turkey look like? Tim mentioned that uh, it's a functioning democracy, and he can see a Turkey after Erdogan. Um, I guess my question is, what if Mr. Erdogan disagrees with you and does not want to go into retirement? And uh, what would folks outside of Turkey, especially portfolio investors, think of that scenario? Tim, that was for you first. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, ESG is a, a big part of everything we now do at funds like Blue Bay and, and many institutional investors. Uh, but as you probably well know, uh, you know, there are there are many favorites in the market uh, that are less than democratic. Egypt is a case in point, right? I mean, Egypt is the favorite destination for for uh, portfolio fund flows uh, in the last couple of years, uh, despite, you know, you could question well, definitely you could question its its democratic credentials, right? And in the end, you know, it, it's about, uh, it's a, I mean, I, I guess the experience of Egypt, it, it's about, you know, orthodox policy. I mean, for orthodox economic policy for institutional investors. They can, and you could say the same about Russia, perhaps, right? Um, um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, if, if you're imagining a scenario where Erdogan loses an election but decides to stay, how would markets and institutional investors view that? Um, well, it would depend, obviously, on, on the Western reaction. You know, in Egypt, the West has been very uh, conciliatory, right, uh, to the uh, Sisi regime. Um, uh, you know, if, if there were sanctions imposed because of whatever Erdogan did that would limit what institutional investors could do, well, okay, that's one issue, that's, that's an issue. And the, the other point is, you know, what would the policy settings look like um, under an un untethered Erdogan? And, and, and I think what we've seen in the last year or two years or so is that, um, you know, uh, if you're going to run a, a, uh, a less than democratic model, um, you know, you, it needs to be compensated by, you know, very pro-market orthodox policies. I think it's quite interesting if you think of G20, Turkey, and, and we can criticize many G20 countries for, you know, on an ESG perspective in terms of governance and, and, domestic, and democracy and all that kind of thing, right? But, but Turkey is the only country in, e, in G20 that runs uber unorthodox monetary policy, right? I mean, which central bank, which central bank in G20 uh, including Saudi Arabia and you name it, right, thinks that high interest rates uh, cause inflation. Or to reduce inflation, you need to cut policy rates. That's, that's the fundamental problem. So, so uh, but actually, just going back to, your, to the question itself, um, I mean, I do think the, 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 the experience of Istanbul, the municipal elections in Istanbul, is that Erdogan could not take uh, could not lose an election and stay in power. 
Um, I think the Turks, both opposition, you know, uh, I mean, you know, many, many AKP supporters in Istanbul, traditional AKP supporters in Istanbul voted for Imamoglu, right? Uh, so I, I don't think Turks would stand for a situation where uh, Erdogan tried to stay in power after losing an, an election. And, and, you know, I, I had some doubts about that, I think, around the Istanbul elections, but, but um, the, the rerun second round proved to me that actually democracy is, is actually okay, survived. Murat, do you agree uh, with that, with Tim's view, or if uh, Erdogan does not go quietly, and particularly is that a red line for both domestic and foreign investors, not even mentioning whether he might uh, subsequently crack down on uh, opponents? Yes, I mean, you know, Turkey's democracy credentials go back 100 years, right? There are plenty of European countries, so-called European countries, that only go back 20 years, 30 years. Egypt only goes back 10 years. So, I mean, it, it, this is not an Egypt. This is not a Saudi Arabia. This is, this is not even a Hungary. I mean, think about Hungary, for God's sake. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it will, whatever the result is, there will not be a coup. Let's put it this way: whether it's internal or external, we are. They're already. They only tried that, and it failed. Thanks, Murat. Well, I think our time is up. Thanks for the question. Thanks to uh, the audience for participating. Thanks again to Tim and Murat for spending the time, and we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Are we off?